Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I apologize for my voice. It is trying to leave me. I'm trying to keep it at least for the next 40, 50 minutes. Um, we'll see how that goes. Luckily, I have a mic. Um, so everything should be good. And, and I have a big, giant bag of triple action American cough drops. So I am set. They're good. <coughs> so let's get started. So I want to talk about how you can take lessons from DevOps and apply them to your AppSec program. Because fundamentally, I think AppSec has to change. I think we need to have a mindset shift. Um, and I'm going to talk through where my head is with that and how I've done that in, in both now, currently at Pearson and also I was uh, the product security lead at Rackspace. So about me, five months ago, I, I left Rackspace and joined Pearson's AppSec group. Um, prior to that, I was at Rackspace. And prior to Rackspace, I had worked in a couple different AppSec consultancies, doing AppSec pen testing, threat modeling, that kind of thing. Um, prior to that, I was, a, I was the AppSec guy at TEA is a Texas education agency. It's a, the non-college <clears throat> uh, education agency for the state of Texas, where we have millions and millions of students. Um, I was also a penetration tester for the state of Texas and also taught at university, as well as ran some IT systems for them. Oh, and my first my first job out of college was at Viatel, which, ironically, being here, um, the IT operations for Viatel were in Bryan College Station, Texas, which is a tiny little town that only exists because the university is there. But almost all of our business, I would say 95% of our business, was in Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, and a little bit of UK. So when I wrote a bad app, I got woken up at 2 in the morning because somebody from Belgium had woken up and found out that I broke it. And he was shouting at me, and I was like, I'm, yo, I'm going to work. Leave me alone. I, I got it. So if you ever want to have quality in your life, make it so that you get woken up at 2 if you mess up. And you will find quality to be a very important aspect of your programming. <coughs> um, besides my professional life, I've been involved in OWASP since 2008. I did, in 2008, for a summer of code, the OWASP Live CD, which has morphed into OWASP WTE. WTE stands for Web Testing Environment. It is a whole bunch of Debian packages um, that have pre-configured tools in them that you can a la carte install on the uh, Debian variant of your choice, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, whatever. Or I also produce VMs. Um, I was on the board of directors for OWASP. I've done a whole bunch of speaking at various conferences internationally and training internationally. I actually have an undergraduate in economics and a master's in MIS, both from Texas A&M University. Um, and I actually, I love the fact, well, I like economics, although I like technology too. But I think it puts a neat perspective having a non-technical degree behind me because it gives me a different point of view. And there are a lot of times when I see things that security people do that set up really awful incentive structures, right? We're going to make this so onerous, you're going to hate your life, but we're going to expect you to do it anyway. Like, no, let's line up the incentives and incentivize people to do the right thing, and we're going to get much better results. At least that's kind of my view of things. So what's the problem? <coughs> well, the problem is, particularly when I moved to Rackspace, the cycle time is getting crazy short. I don't know where you are now. Um, at Rackspace, our sort of statistical outlier was one product group that averaged 75 deploys per week. Right? So please tell me where in those 75 deploys per week my testing window is. Right? There, there isn't one. Um, and if they weren't that aggressive at Rackspace, continual deployment or continuous delivery was a goal anyway. Um, so under that environment, if you're really in an agile, quickly moving shop, this traditional part of the waterfall where you do this one week of security testing, that doesn't exist. And so when I moved over to Rackspace, I realized like all of my sort of past thinking about how I do AppSec, it was, it was irrelevant. It didn't work. And I had to sort of radically rethink what I was doing. Not only that, um, but if you do try to slow down the development work stream, you're just going to get stomped on by the business because, quite honestly, there's a huge first mover advantage, particularly in the software as a service world. Right? If you're the first one to launch the service, you get the buzz, you get the hype. So you will be fighting the business perpetually on your back foot if you try to slow it down. So you really can't, in my mind, slow things down. You have to understand how you can go faster, deliver value to the business while still getting things as secure as humanly possible. <coughs> More of the problem. Oh, yes. So uh, traditional software hasn't really left us a lot of time to test anyway. Back when I was at TEA, I saw a Gantt chart from one of the project managers. 
and you're following down the chart, and there was a little slice for security testing at zero days. Why? Because the schedule had been pushed and pushed and pushed, and they switched all the things at the end, and security testing zero days. Guess what? You're like, that's a, that's a fail from planning. Um, and you had DevOps continuous integration and all those things. There's just, wherever your business is at now, at some point you will be pushed to go much faster than you're going now. Um, and then the other thing, particularly at Rackspace with OpenStack and Python, um, those are interpreted languages, and there's really no good static analysis for Python. So what are you going to do? Like the normal automation you do to try to static analyze this stuff, you can't even do. Right? So even if you could wire that up and automate it, you're kind of on the back foot anyway. And then at Rackspace, in a lot of places now, there are RESTful APIs. And there's really no good automation tool for RESTful APIs. I've seen little or no RESTful APIs actually produce a waddle where I might have a chance to programmatically talk to it. So what do you do, right? You're also behind the eight ball. It's like, it's all doomed, it's all over, we should drink some poison and, and go to sleep. Well, not really, right? We should automate all the things. And I'm going to talk about DevOps and automation and how we've done that both at Rackspace and at Pearson, and just generally what I think needs to happen to make, this ha to make uh, application security be a much more functional part of the business to where we're showing value, not just being the uh, throwing rocks from the edges and screaming we're all going to die. I love this quote, don't get into one form, adapt it, build your own, let it grow, be like water. And I think AppSec has to adapt because the software world is changing at a crazy pace. And if we don't change at a crazy pace, we are going to be left behind. And I think we need to sort of look to our development brethren and find out what they're doing that's cool and works well and co-opt it for us. So I have to say... It is definitely a time to mourn. It is time to bury traditional AppSec where you had this nice week of testing at the end of the development cycle that's dead. We hardly knew you. It's hardly been around all that long anyway, but it's just time to go. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's back up a little bit and talk about a little bit of traditional software versus DevOps, right? The old way, right? Very early, you had a very prescriptive, a long requirements document of all the stuff that's supposed to happen. You had very prescriptive requirements in design. You had very long design, water, uh, design documents. You probably had a waterfall process. Um, you worked in groups and silos, so there was this team that handed it off to that team, that handed it off to that team, right? The devs are done, it goes to QA. The QA is done, it goes to deployment, right? Um, there was very little feedback or loops really purposefully designed, at least in the waterfall places I've been. And at the end, you kind of chucked the code over the wall and said, hey, it worked on my laptop. Good luck deploying it, and we'll see you later. Right? That's sort of the bad old way. Right? So waterfall is this. We've all seen this. I think the problem with waterfall is as you start to walk down it, you're going to fall. Right? This is my idea of waterfall. I think it should just go away. Um, I, I, I just cannot imagine a system where you can know all of the requirements particularly in a, like a six-month deploy window that you need at day one for the month six. Like, that's just silly. The world changes too fast. So the DevOps answer. Um, why did DevOps come around, particularly the cloud companies of the world? They wanted high availability and very fast introduction of features. And that is the polar opposite of waterfall, right? That's not going to happen in waterfall. Because for them, particularly software as a service and cloud manufacturers, that first mover advantage is crazy big, and it's hugely important. And if you get it first, you win a lot of users. Um, the other thing is, I'm back in the olden days when you ship somebody, a, you know those things called CDs? Anybody seen one of those, right? I understand why Waterfall existed. You shipped a product that you had to finally say done and put it onto a hard medium and ship it out via mail or put it in a box and sell it to somebody. Waterfall makes sense for that. But software as a service, modern cloud computing, that's a completely different paradigm. You can change that stuff on the fly. Why would you go through this long, ar arduous process that really nails things down early that need to change late? Um, what makes a difference? It's really a cultural thing. It's not just Jenkins or CI, CD or Docker or the cool new something. It's really a mindset change. Um, and it, it's really focusing on business objectives at, at a team level and really bringing together the system, the, the, what would traditionally be the system administrators and the developers as one group. That really aggressive group at Rack, they actually, every week, one of the developers wore the sysadmin hat. There was five of them. And so one, every five weeks, you were the sysadmin for that group. And they just shifted hats. I mean, you want to talk about sharing responsibility. 
if you screw up the deploy on Friday, your coworker is getting it on Monday, and you guys are all one team. So it really changes the dynamic, right? You have this culture of like, I want to help my friend with me who's part of my team. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and it emphasizes people and process, and particularly repeatability. You want stuff to be push the easy button and get it done. It takes some work initially, but that means all those future deploys are crazy easy. Um, and the goal was better uptime and lower operational costs, right? Because if you can fix these things quickly, you're fine. In a lot of cases at Rackspace, when we had stuff that kind of went squirrely and one of our, you know, one of our end number of web nodes got a little funky, we just take it out of the load balancer rotation and pop a new one. Like we're not even going to, we'll, we'll offline diagnose what went wrong with this thing, but we're not going to try to fix it in place. We'll just kill it, and, well, not kill it, but shift it off the load balancer, pop a new one because we can do that. One or two commands and I have a new thing, I add it to the load balancer pool and it's done. Right? Our customers never know. On the back end, we can take this image of this VM, see what's going on, see why it went south. It's a whole different mindset. We're not really fixing it for production. We're fixing it just so we have lessons learned. <coughs> Notice that the stiffest tree is most easily cracked while bamboo or willow survives by bending with the wind. This is another uh, quote from Bruce Lee, who I quite like. Um, really sticks with me because I think we need to bend. We've been really rigid about we must have the absolute perfect security. My God, if it's not 100%, we're wasting our time. It's just a joke. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe you have to get 80% and that's the best you can do, but that's a heck of a lot of better about whining and screaming and getting nothing done. I think I think we really need to be very pragmatic about how we handle application security, particularly in our programs. So I'm stealing the three ways from the Phoenix Project. If you haven't read that book, um, well, don't leave now, but leave later and go get it or order it on your phone on Amazon or whatever. It's a fantastic book. I, I, man, I read that thing and I was like, I've lived a lot of this guy's life. It was a, it's a great, great book. Um, if I, I was already kind of a fan of, of DevOps, but this pushed me over the, over the cliff. So there's three ways of DevOps discussed in that book. It's, a, it's actually a, a fiction, a story, uh, but they, they cover all of DevOps in this fictional uh, account. And the number one way is workflow. <coughs> so workflow, look at what your purpose is and what pro process adds to it. Like, what do you do for the business and what is your process of getting that done? And make sure that's correct from the beginning to end and you really understand it and it's smooth and well-defined. And I'm not talking about a 400-page process document with 300 bullets. I'm talking about truly understanding it. When I did this for Pearson, I got an 11... What is that, that, that really large size of paper, the big paper size, and I sat it on my desk, and I got a pencil, and I drew out our workflow, right? I didn't do a 300-page document with 100 bullets. It doesn't have to be heavyweight. You just have to understand it and conceptualize it. And for us, that became how we sort of talked about how we were going to do things. So don't, don't think it has to be heavyweight. But then once you get the process, lock it down and iterate on that sucker to make it faster. Um, you may hear this idea of a value stream. That is the name of the process which provides value to the business. So the value stream for AppSec is assessing applications, finding vulnerabilities, and hopefully preventing vulnerabilities if you're doing it early enough. Um, then they also talk about this idea of working from left to right, or I guess from left to right, and left side being the business, and the right side being operations and the customer. So you're working from the business side through to the customer, and you have to sort of change your mindset, because internally, well, I'll talk about this, I think, in the next slide. But yeah, I'll talk about that in the next slide. But for security, right, your customer is actually the development group, right? Those are the ones in the business that you're serving. And then you hear this talk of flow. Flow is the rate at which things go through your system. I've been doing testing for a long time. I can kind of look at an app and go, yeah, that guy will take about three days. Oh, that's a big bunch of hairy code. That's at least a week. I can, I, I've done this enough that I know. But honestly, those are completely out of my backside based on experience, mind you, but still out of my backside. If you do what I'm going to talk about in a couple minutes, you'll actually have numbers behind those, and you can start making really interesting judgments about how you handle contentions in your security program. So just an example workflow, right? You write some code, you commit it to a repository, you run some unit tests, you package that up into a Debian or an RPM or whatever your way of packaging is. You, do, you deploy that to a test, and a test environment, you do integration testing, make sure everything's cool, you deploy it to production, right? That's an example workflow. So what does an example workflow look like for application security, right? Well, to me, it looks like this. 
which I call the AppSec pipeline. So on the far side, we have some requests for our services. I work internally. I'm not a consultant right now. So we have requests for our services. We have an app called Bag of Holding that is, in essence, an inventory and metadata tracking app. Um, we have some orchestration done by Stackstorm. We provision security services. And we also hand out work to people to do manual assessments. All of that. And then we have all, uh, a bunch of automated tools. All of that feeds into ThreadFix, which does the correlation and deduping for us. And then from that, I have one normalized source to pull out reporting and metrics. And we also use that to shove stuff into bug trackers like JIRA. And so now we have a well-defined workflow and a fairly well-known state as things flow through the system. So what are the key features of an AppSec pipeline? The biggest thing for me is it's designed to iteratively improve. Right? I started out with a pencil drawing on a piece of paper. That's one step up from a napkin. Right? And now we have this lined out with multiple servers running at Pearson. Um, I, I, and we're never really going to be done. Right? We're always going to be adding, tweaking, making things a little faster, but on purpose. We didn't design this to be finished. We designed this to continually be added to. And it's a, it's a mindset change that you need to make systems that are designed to have things added a la carte over time because you won't always have time to knock out that next something. But maybe you have a slow week. Now you can add it in. Um, provides a reusable path for AppSec activities to flow. So there's a really common known path through this pipeline. And we can kind of now know where you are in the system. What's the status of this engagement? Oh, it's right here. We've done this and this, but not that. We can actually know that concretely because we have well-defined states. So both for our team and our constituency, the dev and PM groups, we, have, we can tell them exactly where they are in the flow. We don't have a lot of data right now, but over, after a year or so, we will have really good data to know not only are you here, but on average, it takes this much longer to complete. Right? We're actually building a system that will let us say that with confidence. Um, it does rely heavily on automation. I've been almost entirely just writing automation routines. I'm kind of a meta, a meta AppSec person right now. I'm here to make our AppSec people faster, not really to do AppSec, which is fine, because um, we have more than enough work, like I'm sure you guys do. It's designed to grow over time. And mo most importantly, it's designed to very gracefully interconnect with the development process we have of the various teams that we talk to. Right? Because you can't completely, you can't change, you can't force them to change the way they work unless you just like fighting with people. Um, you have to figure out how they work and how you can easily integrate with how they're working. And a great quote from Phoenix Project and somebody else whose name is eluding me. Spending time optimizing anything other than the critical resource is an illusion. And the idea here is if there's a bottleneck somewhere in your pipeline, if you fix things upstream to go faster, you're just building a bigger queue. Yes. Thank you, Eli Goldratt. Thank you for that. Um, if you fix things downstream, it doesn't matter. The flow from that choke point isn't going to get any faster. You'll just have idle time. So you really have to find what that critical bit is and optimize there. So what are the key goals for an AppSec pipeline? Well, I want to optimize a critical resource, which for AppSec is people. I mean, there's 540 some odd of us here at this conference, and that's hardly enough to cover EU, let alone the rest of the bloody world, and I'm from the States. <laughs> right? So we're kind of hurting for people. So we've got to figure out how can we optimize and make the most out of the few people we have in this business. I mean, anything that doesn't require a human brain, that's a great candidate for optimization, right? Because if you can optimize it, you can drive up consistency. If I have a junior guy working for me, but I have a well-defined, mostly automated process, I can be assured that he's at least going to meet the minimums defined by the consistency of my automation. Right? This helps you get the most out of your junior guys and make life easy for your senior guys. Um, it helps us increase work tracking. We now know where people are in status. These people have these engagements, and this is where they're at. Um, it helps us track flow through the system and visibility and nicely in metrics. Right? If do I say this? Oh, well, I think I say this later. I'll, I'll keep that for later. And then it does reduce any friction. Um, well, the idea is to reduce friction between our teams and the, uh, the development teams. Because if we can tie into their bug tracking system and drop something, if their normal process does put issues in the backlog, we're going to put issues in the backlog. Because then we're just like another bug. Now, granted, we have a security tag and we track them. But from a developer point of view, it's just another normal day at the office. So let's talk about the intake. Um, 
So for the intake, there's sort of four major classifications. An existing app, a brand new app, a previously tested app, or an app that needs re uh, findings retested. Those are sort of our main four categorizations. Um, and from those, we're only going to ask you details about that app once. Right? The first time we see whatever your app is, because we just started this in January, we're going to ask you, who's the project manager? What's it written in? What's the audience? You know, a couple of questions of metadata. We capture that in Bank of Holding. The next time you come see us, we just say, hey, is all this still correct? Right? I don't want you to have to fill out a 20 question questionnaire every time you do an assessment. That's stupid. Um, and it just annoys your constituency. Um, yes, I already said that. And then we've been um, adapting and categorizing that data mostly by using tags. And we found a bunch of different ways to sort of slice and dice that information using uh, arbitrary tags tacked onto those applications that we see. And it's been uh, super useful. In the middle of the pipeline, right, this is where we triage inbound requests. And we decide where they're going to go. OK, this is going to be a manual assessment. This is a particularly scary app. It's going to get the full menu. This is a not so scary app. It's going to get only these two automated things. Um, and that allows us to sort of a la carte offer the different uh, security activities we have based on risk. Um, those activities can be run in parallel, which is huge for increasing speed. Um, we automate setup and configuration um, as much as possible so that, for example, for uh, setting up static analysis, we have one method that you can call that just sets up the app in both ThreadFix and Bo and sets it up in our static analyzer. Right? That saves a ton of time, and now it's consistent. That thing's named the same in all three systems. Right? But that kind of automation, if you don't have it in place, it's called this and one and that and the other and something else in the third. Um, so just kind of that little bit of glue code can buy you a lot of, uh, a lot of momentum. And we're really focusing on, we're rather, excuse me, we're having the people, the brains, focus on customizing those scans or those activities, not the setup, right? We're going to hand you, if, you know, ideally, everything possible you need to start whatever your activity is, and then you can customize it to fit that situation. Because we can't automate the customization. We probably don't have the insight into doing that, at least not, not right now. Um, so if we can give you an easy setup, we can get that, you can spend your time doing customization. OK, pipeline the end. So this is a source of truth for all of our AppSec activities. We dump everything into ThreadFix. And so that is, if we want to know the state of what's going on, that's the end of the pipeline. Um, it dedupes and normalizes the findings into one kind of universal standard. Uh, it also does, we use that to generate metrics. I actually wrote some Go code called uh, TF Metrics. It uses some more Go code called TF Client. I'm really original with my names. Uh, but I use that to generate metrics out of ThreadFix now, because if we want to know the status of any app or our AppSec program in total, it's all in ThreadFix. Right? If it's not in ThreadFix, as far as we're concerned, it didn't happen. That is our source of truth. And they have a nice REST interface on ThreadFix that you can pull most of the stuff out of. Um, and also, the, the ThreadFix end of it is the touch point right, with all of our constituency, the developers, the PMs, and what have you. And so when we're producing reports or metrics, it's consistent because um, ThreadFix does that normalization of the various names and stuff from scanners into one normalized form. So why do we like AppSec pipelines? It really allows us good visibility to work in process. We know what's going on at any time. We can log into Bo and see who's working on what and where they are in terms of states. And it's allowed us to sort of better, um, better optimize and understand where those choke points are. And that's where we're focusing our automation. So we focused our automation on setting up the static analysis early on. I'm now currently focusing my time in automating reporting. Um, we, those were the choke points. Those were the pain points we found once we got stuff flowing through the system. Whatever I, we find next, we'll automate that. And we just keep iterating. It has greatly increased your consistency. Um, it's really nice when we un inevitably get the, hey, by the way, we want you to look at this app question. Now we know who's working on what, and we can kind of fairly allocate that. It's not like, what do I remember everybody's working on? It's all in bow. And we can actually make a reasonable judgment. We can also have conversations with the business. If you want to drop everything, it's a fire, look at this app, that's fine. But here's the 10 things that aren't going to happen. Are you cool with that? And before, we really had to do that maybe from our memory at best. Now we can give them concrete answers, which is really fantastic. 
<coughs> excuse me. Oh, that's the cost of switching. And it's been flexible enough that people that are senior and people that are junior have used it without problems, which is important because I'd love to have all senior people, but we don't. And uh, probably you don't either. I'm going to stop talking here because Aaron, uh, my coworker, is doing a talk on this tomorrow who will talk specifically what we did at Pearson. I wanted to kind of keep this high level. So I don't want to steal any more of his thunder than I already have. I'm going to go back to talking DevOps. But I love this pipeline idea. I'm, I'm hooked on it. Uh, I could talk for hours if I had a voice. Okay, so let's go back to workflow. Making each step repeatable. Um, and this is to remove any sort of haphazard and ad hoc work, right? Like when I said, oh, I need to create an app in Bow, I need to create an app in ThreadFix, I need to create an app in the Static Analyzer, I need to create an app in our Dynamic Scanner. And they all have bloody different names, right? Because three different people put them in. Well, if you automate that, you put in one thing and it goes to all the places. Right? Just simple things like that can really reduce friction in between the team members. And I, I tend to just uh, run through the process once manually, see what's required, and then run it through a second time to make sure what I think the process is is correct. And then the third time I automate it and I never look back. Um, scripting languages are definitely your friend. If you don't know one, find one you like and use it. I write in Go because I like Go. There's nothing magical about Go. If you like Python or Ruby or Node, I don't care. Pick the one that you like and write in it. Um, oh, and yes, if, if you're not doing this, you should really look at the configuration management tool, Salt, Puppet, Chef, Ansible. I don't care which one. You can have religious arguments about that. But the fact that you can make a deployment consistent, time in and time out, is huge. Huge, huge, huge. That's why at Rack, when we had a Node go funny, on one of our API endpoints, we just took it out of the load balancer and launched a new one because launching a new one was calling a script. Call new node, new node, add to load balancer, added, we're done. What happened with this guy? Let's go look. Right now it's not a panic, right? I can take my time, get a drink of coffee, and look at why that thing went south as opposed to freaking out and trying to build a new one. Um, <coughs> and I would really... Uh, highly recommend creating deployable artifacts. If you're creating Debian, RPM, MSI, I don't care what they are, but make repeatable deployable artifacts. If nothing else, if you have regression in version two, if you have that old RPM, you can quickly get back to version one, right? RPM remove, RPM add, done, right? As opposed to, oh crap, what were the steps? Where's the run book? Where do I get the code? I got to check it out of the repository. Like, just make that all go away. Oh, and make sure whatever you can do, you can do for one or 100,000 Servers, that's like very important in your mind, right? And you don't have to do one-off things. You need to make them repeatable. I mean, even silly things. Our deployment of Bo, I've automated. I created Debian package that deploys Bo. It's a silly little app that we created internally. But guess what? It's really stinking easy. Deployment time for Bo is like five minutes. I pull it from the repo. I run a couple of scripts. I SCP over a Debian package. I apt get update, and I'm done. All right? There's no thinking. It's just made it really, really easy. So making things repeatable in AppSec, <coughs> right? You're going to be retesting whatever findings you find. So spend the extra 10, 20% when you find them to make a little script to test them. Not only does it make your retesting almost instant, but you can hand that off to the developer and say, guess what? When this thing returns a, a, a zero instead of a one, right? Come talk to me because you probably got it fixed. Because how many times have you said, hey, this is broken? Go fix it. They come back and say it's fixed, and you retest, and you're like, oh, well, you sort of fixed it, but you didn't fix this edge case. Okay, and they go to it again and run, and then, yeah. Like, give them something they can run themselves. Developers don't want to give you code that doesn't work, but if they don't know how to test it, you can't expect them to test it. Give them a little bit of code. I used to do this at Rack, just write quick and dirty little Python scripts that exercised a vulnerability I found, and I handed them to the dev teams. Run this thing until it says yay. When it says yay, it's fixed. Right? Done. Um, oh, make tests easy to understand and easy to be shared. Uh, particularly at Rack, we were always shifting people around, and it was really, uh, it was almost hard to complete an engagement, quite honestly, because we were, the priorities were changing really fast. So if I didn't make my stuff hand-offable, it made it really hard to go on to that next engagement and keep the momentum going. So really think about doing what you're doing in a way that you can hand it off. Stupid tricks work great here. OK, wow. <coughs> I'm going to talk quicker, I guess. Um, stupid trick works great. If you have all of your output from tools in a particular file layout, make a zip drive of all those empty directories, 
just have every engagement, zip it, name it the name of the engagement, drop your files in there. I can hand you my files and you know where everything is. I mean, simple, stupid tricks like that are fantastic. And make tests abstract and combinable. You don't want the one big master test. You want to a la carte a whole bunch of little tests. So I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but the man who has practiced one kick a thousand times, right? And that is really key. Like, you need to be a master of the thing that you're doing. Um, that is a big, big thing. So pick something and get really good at it. Never pass on defects, right? So test early and often. Um, increase the, the rigor of your testing as you go from left to right, because the thing is much more solid, in essence, as it's being developed. Um, and the further right you are, the more expensive it is to fail. So those early tests are really important. For AppSec, defects equal false positives. For every one false positive you report to a developer, that's like 100 real actionable results. I mean, you lose cred points at crazy speed. So really be careful. At Rack, I told the people that work for me, if you want to find my foot in your backside, you will report a false positive. Because quite honestly, you're no better than clicking next five times on Nexus or uh, Nessus, not Nexus, Nessus, and printing a PDF if you're not removing false positives. Like, where is your value add as a human being? There is none, right? No false positives. Um, and then obviously early is best. <coughs> Excuse me, local optimization is with a global view. So you can't speed up something if it messes up the rest of the system. That's the essence of this. I got a 10 minute warning, so I'm gonna go kind of fast. I have a lot of content, I, I apologize. Um, so. Once you've got that process down, this is where you start iterating and going faster, right? Look for steps that are manual that can be automated. Find those paper cuts and those things that annoy you or slow you down and automate them. What is the data I'm missing every time I do a manual application assessment? How can I get that and put it in front of me when I start? Those kind of things are hugely important. So the second one is improve feedback. Um, I have an open source project, the OWASP Live CD. I've had it since 2008. I've probably had, I don't know, 40 bits of feedback. And the last time I counted in 2009, it had been downloaded 300,000 times. I know my stuff is not that good, and I know it has bugs. Um, so like getting feedback is crazy, crazy, crazy valuable. You need to make it really easy for people to talk to your group and let you know, hey, this didn't work for me. I can't understand your report. What the heck does this mean? Like you need to be very open to get that because you're never going to improve if you don't make that simple and easy. Um, and that's how you can take that feedback, internalize it, and make your program that much better. <coughs> um, and for you, your customers are really inside your business. And most importantly, the customer of step two is step one. Right? The previous step is a customer of the prior step. And you have to understand that you're not only in a big pipeline, but you're actually need to present to the next step something that's functional. If you do a manual test and you don't put the results into ThreadFix, you, that work didn't happen as far as we're concerned, right? You have to complete the loop. And then really importantly, embed the knowledge where it's needed. So if you have an automatic deploy script, like for Bo, the documentation on how to deploy it is in the source code repository with Bo. Why? Because if I'm going to deploy it, I'm going to pull the source code out of the repository. Right? It seems like simple, but you'd be amazed. They're like, oh, I'll put that in the wiki, and this other thing's in the repo, and this is over there. Put it all in one place. Like, these are like dumb tricks, but they make all the difference. <coughs> um, and then continual experimentation and learning. The third uh, way of DevOps, and this is getting the business to embrace allowing you to fail. And this is a tough cultural sell in a lot of places. But if you're not experimenting, you're not finding the thing that works. And quite honestly, you're not finding the thing that doesn't work. Um, Edison, who did the light bulb, supposedly tried a fat light bulb. He was quoted as saying he tried all the things that didn't work until he found the one that did. And that was thousands of attempts to make a bloody light bulb. Right? If he wasn't allowed to make thousands of failures, uh, we probably still have light bulbs, but you know what I mean, right? You gotta, you, and the business has to really embrace this. Um, the other thing is that mastery only comes with practice. So the first time you do a deploy, the first time we deployed Bo, it took me a day, quite honestly. Thank you. The second time we deployed Bo, it took me an hour. The third time it took me 15 minutes, and now it's five. 
right? So don't expect my son is terrible about this. He wants to try something the first time and expect he's awesome. I'm like, kid, you're not going to be awesome. You need to do it about a thousand times, and then guess what? You'll start to be awesome. But realize that you're the first time you're going to do this. It's going to be slow. The second time, it'll be faster. So I'm going to talk about experimentations I've done at various places that I found useful. Hopefully, they'll be useful to you. So findings directly into bug trackers. No pen tester or consultant likes reporting. Now, I don't think anybody likes reporting. Um, and in most of the places I've been able to work, I've been able to stop doing god-awful PDFs and drop stuff directly into issue trackers. Because honestly, where are they going to look? The developers, the PMs, are going to look in the issue tracker. They don't want to read a giant PDF. Not only that, if you put them in issue tracker sensibly, they can break up that one big engagement of n number of findings into individual concrete work. If you're an agile shop, that's how it's going to be worked anyway. You just save the PM the time of entering all that crap into the backlog anyway. You just made a friend. <coughs> um, and the issues are part of the normal workflow. We use ThreadFix to do this. Um, if, you have an, if you have a bug tracker, you get bonus points if it is an API, but you will definitely need a security category so you can distinguish your bugs from others. Ah, for the resident nag, nag, nag. So for each, and this is really a crucial mindset difference, for each severity of finding that we have, we have an SLA. The SLA is not to have it fixed. Not to have it fixed. It's to have a mitigation plan in place. Because quite honestly, in a lot of vulnerabilities that you find testing, you have no idea what works. I, mean, I have a rough guess because I've done this a while, but I honestly don't know what it's going to take. So let's get together. And if we have a critical, we have 24 hours to get together and have a meeting of the minds and understand that by this date that I can now put into a calendar and hold you to, you will have it fixed. But it, it allows an equal footing for both us and the PMs and the dev teams to discuss how we're going to get this thing done. Because we have to agree on this. And arbitrarily deciding that a critical takes three days, who the hell knows? If they have to re-architect the whole thing, that could be six months, right? So don't make the SLA be days to get fixed. Make it days to have a mitigation plan in place. That was a huge culture change for me, and it really helped. Um, and then we age all the findings based on that SLA. And then we start reminding people politely, hey, you got seven days on your mediums. We need a, we need a date. And if they don't talk, we start walking up the org chart, getting to the director, or in Rackspace's case, the head of product. These teams have these outstanding vulnerabilities, and they won't even talk to us about getting them fixed. And that, you've know, you got to get management buy-in, make sure management is cool with this. You'll start a nice little war if you don't. But you'll actually really start to get traction on getting these things fixed. And it's amazing when you have one of the groups that I dealt with at RAC, we had an hour meeting scheduled because that's just the block you schedule them in. 20 minutes later, I'm like, that's what you're going to do. That's the date. OK, we're done. See you later. Have 40 minutes back in your life. Done. Right? We, we just need to rationally talk about how we get this fixed. As long as your fix is good and timely and I'm OK with it, we're fine. No reason to get excited about it. Um, bonus points if you can put this in a dashboard, because then you get this. I used to play this game all the time at Rack. Gee, the cloud database product got theirs fixed. I wonder why it's taking you guys cloud files so long. Ha ha ha. You know, get those pride things going. Boom. Stuff get fixed. Automating infrastructure, I talked about this earlier. Chef, Puppet, Ansible. These are declarative languages. You can write, in essence, a script. For a program to make a deployment, you can check it into source code, you can version it. Right? These are fantastic things. So here's an example. I forget what this does. I don't know, it installs something somewhere. But this has methods to where you can bundle up installation routines and setups for various servers. Right? This is a place where, as a security person, you should spend a lot of your cycles. Because if you can prove that the automated deployment is hardened, guess what? I don't care if you launch one or 50 of them, because they're all the same and they're all hardened. So the work I did to get that one hardened is now repeated every time you do a deploy. This is a huge, huge, huge productivity gain if you can get there. We did this at Rack, and it was fantastic. Um, and then if you want good karma points, Merge those patches upstream, because you can download these recipes, cookbooks, what have you, from internet. And those are usually, quite honestly, security crap. Because they just get it working, they don't actually harden anything. So good karma points make a hardened Nginx, not just get Nginx. Then the other thing with these configuration management tools, OK, I got zero minutes. I'll go really quick. 
is that they have tags and you can apply requirements to those tags. So in this case, I have the cache servers get monitoring and mem memcache. The database get monitoring and MySQL. You can actually make a security requirements based on the tags. All databases must do these things. All servers, period, must not allow root login. Right? Those are the kind of things you can do with this automation. Inspector, you need one. So a post-deployment hook that goes back and verifies. This is kind of like the builder idea. You have an architect who designs the building. You have a builder that builds it. And then you have the building inspector who comes in and makes sure everything's cool. So we had a post-deployment hook that would go do a quick scan of the deployments and make sure they were kosher. Right? This is a huge way to get, um, to get uh, visibility into those deployments and know what's going on. You can also use Linus, which is a GPL open source project. It's a whole big bunch of SH script to do hardening checks. And it's fantastic because you know what the dependencies are? Bash. Like, show me a Linux that doesn't have Bash. Like, hey, it's easy to deploy. You drop it, you untar it, you run it. Done. Um, agent, you really need one of these. Um, it's a, and if you want to sell it to sysadmins, it's a read-only agent that just looks at the configuration of the system and reports that st configuration state back to the mothership. And if you really want to do this right, you have a policy, and then you can enforce that policy. Now, if there's like back a couple years ago when Jenkins had the bad vulnerability, you can have your mole tell you everybody who has Jenkins and what version it is, and then you can go to those teams and get them done. You can throw it up on a board and show all the red Jenkins and watch them turn green. Right? That's a huge thing. Cloud Passage is a commercial product that does this. Mozilla MIG is an open source product that does something like this. But I, even if you write your own little bit of Python or what have you, it's super crazy handy. And I think, yeah, this is, this is the last one. Turning vulnerabilities on its head. So instead of doing the normal scan report, go fix, so start subscribing to all the announce lists or the security lists or the whatever lists for the products that are key to your apps. And then now you get an email that comes in that says, hey, there's a really bad problem in Tomcat. Now you're going to the dev teams and the ops teams and saying, hey, there's a bad problem in Tomcat. How are we going to get this done? Not, I'm going to wait six months until the quarterly scan happens. I'm going to do a scan and we're all going to freak out because Tomcat has been out of date for six months. Right? It just completely turns things around. Now you're having a nice, calm conversation about how we can get this updated instead of like, oh, God, the world's going to end. It's been vulnerable for how long? Um, I honestly used Gmails and some clever filters, and that worked rather well for me when I had no budget to do this. There's also a, uh, a product called Secunia Vim uh, that does this for you for commercially. But it's really nice to be able to proactively approach the ops teams and say, hey, we got this problem, let's figure it out. It just, I just heard about it today, as opposed to like, oh god, we've been vulnerable for months. <coughs> Excuse me, key takeaways, automate, right? Look for paper cuts and fix those things first. Because if nothing else, we all have to work, and we ought, to, we ought to enjoy it. So if you can fix the paper cuts that make you hate life, life will be a lot better for you. Um, and then find out your workflow, right? Make your own AppSec pipeline. I don't care if it looks like what we did, but you really need to understand that workflow and start getting some tooling around it, because it will really speed up your systems. And crucially, make those things designed to be um, grown organically, right? You're never really done. You're always adding things to make it a little bit better. And just as, a, as, a, as an industry, we have to be a lot better with accepting kind of testing standards that are, you must be this high to ride the ride, not you're perfect. Because a lot of the stuff I ended up doing at Rack that was fully automated was you must be this high to ride the ride. You passed a smell test. I don't know if you're really rugged, but at least I know you're not a basket case, right? And that's something you can do in an automated fashion. And if you don't do it, start learning to talk dev, because that's who you're going to talk to. You get a lot more cred points if you say, oh, that's cool using CI, CD with Jenkins. Oh, and you got Ansible scripts to do that? Sweet. Right? If you can talk dev, you're in a way better place. I love both of these books. They're fantastic reads. I would highly, 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 highly recommend go get the Phoenix Project and read it. The other one is fantastic if you're doing cloud operations. And questions, if I have any time. We have 15 seconds. Have 15 seconds. <laughs> any really quick questions? Yes, sir. Are you, we're using Gauntlet, not currently, but it is in our roadmap. We, we're not to that point yet, honestly, in our pipeline. The next step for us is going to be doing a lot of that baseline security scanning work, and that's where that we'll use Gauntlet. That'll probably be August-ish when we get there, I would guess.
Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Yes. A of applause. My voice made it. Hey. Uh. So we have uh, five minutes to switch rooms if you want to go to the